Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Youth Politics UK's Leaders of Tomorrow event. My name is Daniel Laws, and I am the organization's chief executive. Uh, in a moment, we'll be chatting to four incredible young leaders about their activism, advice, and hopes for the future. Uh, just before we start, just a few points about housekeeping. First of all, this webinar today is being recorded, so if you'd like to access the discussion today to share with your own networks, please do get in touch with us following the event. The event will be structured into two halves. The first half will involve five minute statements given by each of the panelists about their own leadership journeys. I'll then chip in with one or two follow up questions if the time is permitting. Uh, next, we'll move, uh, we'll open the floor to a and a session. This is an amazing opportunity for all those watching to put questions to four people who have such a wealth of experience behind them. So please do take it. If you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to use our Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Type in your question if you'd like to ask it live, please follow the question with an L and, if we, uh, and we will enable your audio. If you prefer me to ask your question to the pan panelists, do not worry, uh, just leave out the L. Uh, that's all the housekeeping done. So if you have any comments or questions about the event itself, please do use the chat function and a member of our team will be in touch. Um, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first panelist this evening. Uh, we're going to introduce Noga levy Rappaport, who is a youth climate activist and a lead organiser for the UK Student Climate Network. Uh, she organises the climate strikes across the UK and helps to coordinate the International Fridays for Future movement. She's spoken at and organised several rallies and events to demand urgent climate action. She's been recognised as one of the most influential Londoners of 2019 for her work on youth empowerment, educational reform and systemic change from the grassroots to the global level. Thank you so much for coming today, Noga, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, thanks for having me, Dan. Um, I guess I really wanted to talk about what, like, what youth activism has meant to me, how that's shaped my life, um, and how hopefully I can use it to shape others' lives. Um, as Dan said, I'm an 18-year-old climate activist and organiser, um, and for the past year and a half, I've been organising the climate strikes across the UK and working on an international level to coordinate the new youth climate justice movement that's sprung up over the past couple of years. Um, I've also broadened my work onto youth empowerment, educational reform and systemic change, working with the National Lottery to direct their Climate Action Fund and Community Fund, as well as going into schools and discussing with students and teachers how we can reshape our education system to accommodate for the radical ideas and the need for new spaces that we are seeing all the time. Um, I only really became involved with anything uh, when I was around 15 years old, um, when I started getting involved in local grassroots work through setting up a local community theatre for kids who couldn't afford um, otherwise very expensive drama classes. Um, for me, as someone who'd always been very politically engaged and had kind of been ostracised quite a fair amount for that, um, it was a real moment where I could kind of translate the anger that I'd always felt around politics into actual local action. Um, this allowed for uh, over the last few years around a, a total of around 100 people from my local area to really get involved and put on professional level shows um, which were totally directed, produced um, and musically directed as well by young people and this was I think a real turning point for me in understanding the power that young people have to reshape each other's lives um, and really in understanding that and I know, I know it sounds cheesy, but that anything is possible. Um, and I think the idea that anything is possible is, is one that we often view as, as very naive, as very, you know, hopelessly optimistic. But for me, that's the, that's the unique power that young people have. I think in a world that's particularly in, in the activism world that's been ravaged by hopelessness, our optimism is key it is exciting it is something that is totally unique and specific to us and it allows us to delve into new areas of social justice that still are untouched um, since the dawn of time every single social justice movement has been led by young people we fall in love with the world around us we fall in love with people around us and we recognize that empathy is our strongest weapon we recognize that the moment you start to value every other person young or old with the same dignity that you would want to be valued you 
understand that you never have to ask permission or defer to others in order to make the change that you want to see in the world in order to act on what you feel is right. And I think it's a belief that the actions and futures of children and young people like us rely on, particularly when we're faced with a dire ecological emergency. There's never been a time where it's more important, more imperative even, that children around the world realise our own strength and take action for our planet. And this starts at home, it starts with our communities, it starts with the support networks around us, and it starts with enfranchising young people to fight not just the climate crisis, but empowering youth like me to collectively reshape our own communities and ensure real change happens to our society securely from the bottom up. We have incredible digital networks. We have an online language that really only we can understand. We have an endless archive that is the internet, that is social media. We can share and inspire each other all the time. With all, this, with all these resources at our fingertips, we cannot morally shirk away from our duty to go out into the world and shift the power structures that we see. We cannot morally sit by and say yeah i think what's going on is wrong and it's terrible but i'm not going to do anything about it when we know that we have the power to do it and i mean right now that seems very intimidating and very difficult i think particularly in the time of, of the coronavirus crisis and as kind of climate change crashes down before us but for me it's it's a way of saying okay this we are we have a moment in which a mirror is being held up to our faces. We are watching our own systems be battered by economic, political, environmental and public health crises. And we have an opportunity to learn from this and reshape our world after COVID-19. We can reshape our education system. We can fight for the kinds of radical spaces that so many young people are missing out on. We can fight to enfranchise ourselves, to reform our educational system, to break out of the very restrictive systems in which we live and learn and allow ourselves to view our frameworks as a place of opportunity and development and understanding, to encourage each other to step out onto the streets and self-organize and look at the injustices around us and rise up against them. Because ultimately, a safer and more equitable future can only come about when we build solidarity and community across borders and across age gaps. And we can't leave anyone behind, young or old, when we organise for a better future, especially as we fight against pandemic. And anything we do now and in the longer term recovery has to be with the aim of ending global injustices, conflict and environmental degradation and of guaranteeing human rights and free movement for all. Because from local communities to the world stage, what I've learned over the past few years is that we have to organize, share solutions, share technology, transfer finance and redistribute wealth where it's needed. Because only then, only when we tackle our systems at their roots and fundamentally overturn them, can we truly achieve climate justice. Thank you so much for those words. We really do appreciate it. And just one follow-up question to that statement what would you say to young people who are really passionate about combating climate change but don't know where to start where would you advise they do start i mean obviously right now it's difficult because normally i just say get out and go organize a protest come on you can do it um but obviously we're fairly limited with that right now i would say take this time when you can only be online to collaborate and reach out to other people to build a network around you so the moment we can get back out onto the street safely you can say okay i want to organize this demonstration i want to pressure my school i want to pressure my local authorities i want to pressure the government build that network now build that support system reach out to people because you never know who's going to answer your dms and say you know can you help me i want to build this i want to build that like what avenue specifically do you want to go? There is nothing like a support network to make a difference. Thank you so much, Noga. We really do appreciate it. And of course, save your questions. Uh, you can even start bringing them in on the Q&A function now. And we will come to you later. If there are any specific questions that have arisen um, as a result of Noga's speech. So thank you, Noga.
Um, we're now going to go and introduce Mete Cobin. Now, Mete Cobin is the chief executive of My Life, My Say. He's best known for founding the All Party Parliamentary Group for a better uh, Brexit for young people and for contributing to the increase in turnout for young people at the 2017 UK general elections, as well as for receiving the UK government's National Democracy Changemaker of the Year Award in 2018. He's the youngest ever elected councillor in the London Borough of Hackney and is also the chair of the Skills, Economy and Growth Commission. Uh, previously, he worked in the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's election campaign, leading on youth engagement. Mete, it's a pleasure to have you here and take it away. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you so much for um, the introduction and all the work uh, that you do. Um, how do you follow on from Noga's uh, speech? Such a great speech and it's great to see uh, that, you know, young people are kind of leading the conversation uh, in the future of our planet. And actually, when you look at the climate strikes, you can see it's sort of shaken up our political institutions and politicians to sort of bring about uh, change. And, you know, I see that firsthand um, in Hackney, for example, where we declared a climate emergency. And, you know, following that, you know, we launched a, uh, any, our own sort of energy company. Um, and also, you know, we're doing some really big uh, sort of moves around, you know, moving people to recycling more and, you know, investing more into sort of a, a more green economy, one that puts uh, just transition um, at the core and heart of it. Um, yeah, everyone, just to, you know, follow up on Dan's uh, intro. Um, I guess for me, you know, look, my parents came to London from Northern Cyprus. Uh, for any of you who don't know Northern Cyprus, it's, uh, it's the northern side of Cyprus. <laughs> uh, it's not a recognised country. Um, so I was a citizen of nowhere when we first came uh, to the UK as a two-year-old. Um, and we, when we came to, to the UK and we moved to somewhere called Hackney, where I'm from, um, and Hackney, for some of you who will and won't know, um, Hackney is a very nice and trendy place to live now, but once upon a time wasn't. And, you know, used to have one of the highest rates of crime in the country, uh, had one of the highest rates of poverty in the country. Um, more than half the school shut down between 97 and 2003. I was actually one of the 63% of 11-year-old pupils who couldn't go to school in my borough because all of the schools got shut down and went into special uh, measures. Um, you know, it was ranked as the worst place to live out of 464 local authorities or 434 local authorities in the UK just in 2006. Um, and, you know, fast forward that now to what, 14 years, uh, you're talking about, you know, the home of the tech hub being in, in Hackney. You're talking about, uh, for example, it being known as the hipster part of London. Um, it's London's nightlife, places like Shoreditch, if you've gone out in Hackney, um, is it, obviously a major transformation. So, you know, for me, a big part of who I am today and why I got into politics and why I'm so passionate about youth voice and making sure that, you know, our generation is heard is partly because of my background. Because when I was growing up, growing up on a council estate, you know, I often felt powerless, I often felt neglected, and I often felt unheard. And, you know, for, for many of us in growing up where, where I grew up was, you know, no one really cared about what your future of your education looked like, what type of job you got. Um, I remember going to my teacher at the age of 10 and saying, you know, well, her asking me, I'm so it wasn't like I told her, she asked me, what do you want to be when you're older? And I said, I want to be a pilot. And she said to me, you know, be realistic, you're young and you're from Hackney. Um, and that was the sort of type of response that we got um, from where uh, I grew up in. And for me, it was always about how do you create a system um, and how do you sort of champion uh, the voice of those who often uh, don't are, are not heard. So that's why I founded uh, My Life, My Say, which aims to empower young people uh, to participate in democracy. And through My Life, My Say, you know, we've reached hundreds of thousands of young people, uh, you know, digitally over the last couple of years. Uh, we've re worked with more than 40,000 young people face to face. Uh, we're best known for something called the Democracy Cafe, which basically um, is our reinvigoration of the 70th century concept of talking about politics over coffee. We've done more than 130 of these. And what I'm really proud about, Dan, is that more than 80% of these events take place out of London. Um, and we've done 14 across Europe. And we also, this year, at the start of this year, you know, before COVID, I was actually in America where we were doing democracy cafes uh, in America. So, you know, for me, it's uh, always been really passionate about giving a voice to, you know, people who often are not heard. And, you know, even when we say, how do you engage young people in politics? You know, I think the question is wrong from the start because it assumes that young people are one big homogenous group and it doesn't recognize the intersectionalities that exist uh, within the wider group, you know, and, and it's important that when we think about how you engage with underrepresented communities, we think about all of those different intersectionalities. Um, and so, so yeah, so I, you know, the organization has grown from strength to strength and 
through that, you know, we're able to do some great things. And, you know, for me, it was, it's a great experience and I love what I do with my life, my say, but I also feel like there's only so much you can do um, from sort of the outside. And sometimes you need to be in the system to change it. Um, so I, you know, when I was 20, I decided, you know, there was a council elections coming up uh, for my local area in Stoke Newington. Um, and I just thought, you know what, like I'm going to put myself forward because there's no point of complaining about these things if you're not willing to sort of to step up to the challenge. And for me, what was really important was that, you know, it was essentially two things that if I can answer myself and that'll be my advice for most people on this call. One is if you're going to, well, if you're going to stand to be a politician or if you're going to stand to be in politics, I think there's two things that you really need to be able to sort of to answer to. One is, are you genuinely going into it because you're, you're going in with the ambition and the, the you know, whether it, it materializes or not, are you going in with the ambition to sort of make change and make change for the world and to make the world a better place? And two is it, do you genuinely believe you're the best person to, to, to basically represent those people? Um, and I say that because if you can't convince yourself that you're the best person to do it and there's no one else better than you to do it, then you should sort of step back uh, straight away. Um, and at the time, you know, like it was obviously a quite a, um, in many ways, it was quite a daunting experience, you know, as a 20 year old standing for a safe seat, um, which was very highly contested. Uh, no one expected that I would have won it. But what I done was I was able to engage with a lot of the young members in those areas and they got them to sort of to come out um, and to vote for me. And, and in the end, I won sort of, sort of quite comfortably. Um, and, you know, for me, right at the core of it was, you know, I wanted to be a voice for people who look and sound like me and who, are, who've, you know, lost their faith in political institutions and politicians to sort of act as an agency for social uh, change. Um, so that's sort of, uh, I guess, like my sort of background into politics and why I do what I do. And I feel like my, my background, where I'm from and the inequalities that we face growing up um, have massively sort of shaped who, who I am today and the way I think. And, you know, like Dan and others on this call will know me as well. Like I spend probably, you know, every hour of the day uh, working uh, nonstop. Um, I've been doing this now for 12 years, which is, could be a good thing, but it's also a bad thing as well. You know, it's time for others to sort of to step up, like people like Dan, for example, and others on this call to, to go on and sort of to lead that. Um, but I'm really passionate about what I do. And whilst I still have that passion in my heart, um, I'll still continue to, to do that. And what I'm really passionate about now is obviously we've got the COVID-19 crisis where it exposes and amplifies a lot of inequalities in our society, um, and particularly for our generation. But the sad thing is, is no one's really talking about us in this whole uh, crisis. Everyone is, of course, talking about other groups, and rightly so, because there are some groups who are much more vulnerable. But, you know, the economic, the subsequent economic downturn is going to have a huge implication for our generation. You know, if some of you will remember the, the, the financial crisis, and of course, with the financial crisis, you know, when we were in what was it 74 percent national debt of our gdp you know the government's response to that was to have 10 years of austerity and now you know we're more than 100 percent of our national debt so actually we've ended up in a position where we've had 10 years of austerity and um, albeit because obviously of coronavirus pandemic and you know we've had to sort of borrow more but the reality is is someone's going to have to pay for all of this money at some point um, and the question is who's going to have to pay for it and who's going to have to pay for the sort of the, the consequences of the of our economy and so my biggest concern is is that our voices will be uh, lost and that's why as my life might say we launched the forgotten generation campaign because we're looking at specifically you know pushing on government to one launch an inquiry um, and secondly to look at how we can set up a national youth task force and making sure that our generation is involved in this question mark about how do you build back a better society and how do you build back a better Britain one that you know like Noga said how do you build this is an opportunity for us to actually you know rebuild our economy in a way that you know puts a green economy right at the core of it changes the metrics to how we define um its success as economic growth puts inclusivity right at the core of it um you know because till now again what is success to us is because we have GDP economic growth but is that really success is it people's should it be people's mental well-being should it be how we measure the environment all of these different factors and I feel like this is a genuine opportunity for us to do that and my concern is when you look outside where you know lockdowns being eased you know you can see it already through people's attitudes it's like people have forgotten what's happened over the last three months and my concern is is that you know this will all be very quickly forgotten and what will happen is we'll just fall back into the routine of where we were before and we would have missed out on what, what is such a huge opportunity for us to help reshape society. So um, I really, really urge everyone in this call to, you know, to do all in, the, in your power. And, you know, like 
Logan said, there are lots of things practically you can do, even if you're at home, to really start building some of these partnerships and collaborations uh, to think about how we can be involved in this conversation. Because, you know, if we don't put this com the, the pressure on the government right now, we will miss out on our opportunity. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, my, big, my biggest concern is, is that we will sort of uh, bear the brunt of those costs. So um, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Mete. Really do appreciate it. Really powerful statement there. And what we'll do is, if anyone has any questions about what Mete has talked about, uh, what we'll do is we'll move on now quickly to the next speaker. But if you have any questions, please do put it in the Q&A and uh, we'll ask him later on. So thank you so much, Mete, for that. Um, yeah, next up, we're going to introduce Gabby Bello. So Gabby, at 20 years old, is the operations director of the Yes She Can campaign and the founder of an online clothing company, Gabby's Activism Shop, where she donates 100% of the proceeds to pro-immigration organizations and non-profits. She's also in her third year at George Washington University, where she's pursuing a bachelor's in human services and social justice with a minor in law and society. Gabby, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Dan, for that. And I'm just so honored to be on this panel with you all. You all are doing such amazing things, and it's so um, inspiring to see. And thinking on my journey, it's, it's quite funny, like growing up, I never considered myself to be a young leader. Um, and actually I was like, I wanna be a sports psychologist and kind of go down that route for my life. But it's quite interesting because I, I'm from Chicago um, and there's a lot of different issue areas that are very like rampant here. Um, and I'm also a black woman, but I also am an immigrant and things like that. And so throughout my everyday life, I would just recognize so many different injustices. And that kind of became the norm for me. And then after a while, I was like, we need more people in this field. We need more people doing this. And I had so many ideas. And it got to the point where I was like, well, why don't I just do that myself? And if I'm the one saying all of these things, then I should be the one that's in that room. And I'm the one who has experienced those things firsthand. And so a lot of the work that I do directly challenges systemic racism and the inequities that we see today that have manifested into so many of the different systems that we have in the United States. And I truly also believe that the reason I'm even considered a young leader is due to my parents, um, especially my mom. I have been raised in a household that encourages selflessness through serving with others. So from about the age of seven, I have been actively engaging and volunteering in my community. And my parents were also very education focused, which I think a lot of immigrant parents are in general, but I have always been um, a very curious person, um, especially as a child, always asking why in search of the root causes of things. And so my parents really embraced that aspect of me, although I'm pretty sure they found it quite annoying at times. Um, but they encouraged me to then think critically and question what people often accept as the truth at face value. And I think we're really in a time where we know that the first thing that we see or the first thing that we hear, or the first thing that we think of is not necessarily the truth, especially within our education systems. A lot of the history that we have been taught, a lot of the people we have been taught are heroes aren't actually that. And so it's really important that we continue to self-educate and question why things are the way that they are, especially from an intersectional lens. Um, because as we're even talking, like when we talk about mental health, like getting access and resources for mental health is a form of racial justice. Climate justice is a form of racial justice. All of these things are interconnected and we need to look at it through that lens because if we don't, then so many people who are getting the brunt end of that will be left out of those conversations. And so when you are um, tackling these issues, that's one thing that I definitely recommend. Um, and also don't let people discourage you because of your age or because of because you're young, because as someone who has ran companies, been involved in higher up companies, when you come to the table, they're always like, oh, but like, who's your advisor? Who's leading you? Or like, is there an adult in the room? And you have to be like, no, I am the adult in the room. This is my project. I am educated on this and have that confidence because a lot of people will try to beat you down or make you question yourself um, because of your age. And that is coming from the perspective of someone who has like worked with local politicians and someone who has like advocated and organized. Um, and so I think that's something that's really important. And as we can see based off of current events, we are often 
um, the first ones to speak up in times of crisis. And I think we should build on that momentum and engage a wider group of policymakers and individuals to create more effective, responsive, and accountable systems. And that's why for the current and post-COVID world, I think we have the responsibility of creating the new normal, one that deconstructs and rebuilds the institutions that we have now, because now more than ever, it is quite clear that the current way of doing things is unjust and produces inequities that manifest into even greater monstrosities. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have to add. <laughs> Thank you, Gabby, for that for that statement. It was it was really interesting, and also I was just I wanted to follow up with a quick question. Um, you have experience both in the UK, but you said you're based now in the United States. Obviously, we have um, a bit of a we're mainly uh, UK based uh, here with Youth Politics UK, but we do have quite a few international people logging on today, and a few members from the United States. So I'm just wondering what the sort of atmosphere is like there at the minute um, and whether or not you really do sense that this generation is uh, pulling themselves forward as young leaders in the United States. Yeah, definitely. I would say that the current like governmental versus community relations are very, very tense and people are very, very frustrated. And I think it's because a lot of the people who have seen these things firsthand on a daily basis are fed up and then there's a lot of people who are now becoming more aware and like wanting to learn and wanting to engage but then leaning on the people who go through that every day um, and it's kind of adding another burden on top of that on top of justice not really being served in a lot of the cases and I'm mainly speaking about um, the police brutality that we experience here but as well as even when we look at COVID um, black and brown communities are disproportionately affected. And so that's also another burden that has been placed. But I think young people, like we're the ones that are organizing protests, we're the ones that are marching and being super careful about how we're handling things. Like even with the protests that I've organized, we have gloves, masks, hand sanitizers, we're doing everything that we can, but we're also, you know, protesting on the mayor's lawn, on the attorney general's lawn to make them you know like, hey, we see you and we're aware. And I think what I've been proud of most is that young people are starting to realize, hey, politicians and like those in power work for us and not the other way around and they deserve to be held accountable or they will get fired and they will lose their power and their position. Um, and so I think really we have been fighting and advocating and although the media doesn't necessarily broadcast that all the time because it doesn't necessarily sometimes fit into the narrative that they want to portray. People have been out here every day um, and young people haven't stopped fighting. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gabby. We're now going to move over to Ben West, who's our final speaker for the evening. Ben started by organising a charity walk to raise money for his brother's foundation, which promotes awareness of mental health in young people. From there, Ben founded the project Walk to Talk, uh, which has raised over £100,000 to date and delivers talks to young people at schools with practical information on coping with stress. Most recently, Ben has led a petition which aims to make mental health first aid compulsory part of teacher training and has now been signed by almost 300,000 people. And he's working closely with the government to accelerate its development. Ben, thank you so much for coming this evening and uh, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much, Dan. What an honour to be on this panel with everyone. Um, that was so inspiring hearing everything you had to say. Um, I just wanted to touch on to start, the, I think something that Gabby said at the start of her thing was, um, you never, I never expected myself to be talking about um, youth leading or, or creating change. I never expected to be talking about this. Um, and I am a mental health campaigner now, something else I, I didn't expect to be doing. Um, because, you know, to start my story, I want to take us back to about three years ago. And imagine me, I was 17 years old. And I had absolutely no idea what mental health was. I had absolutely no idea what depression or any of these words meant. Um, I mean, I thought that depression was just for people that had lots of cats and lived alone at home, right? That was the extent of my, my knowledge of it. Um, and then my brother got diagnosed with depression and I was told about this diagnosis and it went straight over my head. I just had a no idea what that was. And I, I kind of, I kind of went, I'll put on a happy song, um, and just get over it because you know, that's, that's what I do if I was feeling upset or, or sad. Um, and then a few months later, in January 2018, very, very, very unexpectedly um, and very tragically, Sam took his own life. Um, 
and I, it was in the weeks following that that I got hundreds, literally hundreds of people message me um, in amongst all the messages of, of condolence and, and, you know, the messages saying, you know, what can I buy anything from the shop? Um, there were about 100, over 100 uh, people that actually messaged me and talked talk to me about their own mental health struggles. And it became apparent very quickly that this wasn't an issue that just faced Sam and my family. This is an issue that, that touched almost everyone I knew in some form. And then I got two messages, two people messaged me saying that they had attempted suicide and hadn't told anyone. And I felt this was almost guilt that these were people that I meant to know and they didn't feel comfortable talking to me about these problems. And I guess I just, in that moment, I just felt like I had a, had a I was in a position where I could actually help these people um, and create an atmosphere that they felt like they could talk. So that's where um, the, the walk came from. I just wanted to get everyone in our local community together, just walking and talking about mental health. And our strap line for that walk was make mental health a conversation. And that's exactly what we did from the get go. Um, we set our walk, it was a 200 kilometre walk over 10 days to the House of Parliament in London. We had 450 people walk with us and it was just, we we're handing out leaflets, getting that conversation going. Um, and much like what we say all the time about putting on a cup of tea, if you want to talk to someone about something deep, walking is also very, very good at that. Um, once you're preoccupied and you're doing something outside and you're, you know, you're walking along, it's a lot easier to talk about issues that you wouldn't necessarily talk about in a, in a more stressful, formal situation. Um, and so when the walk finished, um, we raised a bit of money, which was amazing. Um, but really the biggest takeaway for me or the biggest success factor that we, that we found was the number of people that messaged me, wrote, to me emailed me saying you know I've seen a counsellor for the first time or um, you know they've spoken to their family about these issues for the first time or, or people have, have torn up their suicide notes and I, I that was a really massive moment for me um, and so what was initially only meant to be a one-off thing turned into something that I was <laughs> far too deep to, to get out of um, and so I started talking to uh, some of my teachers at school and some of my brother's teachers and it became apparent that teachers don't receive any training in mental health at all, full stop. The two words mental health don't come up in teacher training, full stop, which just seems absolutely absurd, absolutely absurd. Um, and so I felt this, and I'm sure the rest of the panel and a lot of people watching will, will, um, will hear me here where I said I just felt this fire in my belly and I was just like, wow, you know, I've got to do something about that because that's just absolutely ridiculous that that's not something that's already a thing. Um, and so I set up a petition online to make mental health first aid a compulsory part of teacher training. And uh, for some reason, uh, it absolutely exploded. And uh, we got, like Dan said, 300,000 signatures. Um, I've been to see the prime minister twice now to talk about taking it forward, um, which is all so, so surreal considering three years ago, I had no idea what mental health was. Um, and so that's really my, my journey. And I just wanted to touch upon sort of the youth leadership and how we, how we use our voice because, you know, I'm, I'm a recipient of the Dan, Diana Award and something I'm very proud of. And their, their strap line, what they always say is young people have the power to change the world. We have the power and everyone has that power to change the world. Everyone has the power to use their voice to invoke change. And I think it's so important that we all appreciate that power in each other um, and appreciate it in yourself because I mean look at my journey three years ago I didn't even know what mental health was and now I'm one of the leading uh, mental health campaigners in the country um, and doing stuff stuff like going to 10 Downing Street and talking to the Prime Minister and, and educational advisors about policy um, and I think where am I going with this um, it, I think it's so important as young people especially that we allow ourselves to um to realize that we can be heard uh because i remember one moment where we were planning to do this walk and it we i didn't really have much confidence that it would work because i didn't really have much confidence that people would want to talk about this sort of thing um and i went to talk to our local mp about it and i sat down and she just went this is a great idea took over said you're not finishing in hyde park we're going to take you to the house of parliament we're going to get the whole of cabinet um, to come and, and meet you, have a big reception there. Um, and that was really the moment where I realised that we had 
that realized that I was being taken seriously despite my age because you do get that quite a lot I think someone mentioned it earlier where people kind of laugh at you and be like where's the adult in the situation and you're like here I am <laughs> and people don't don't really know what to say but yeah I think it's really important that we all realize that all you need to do is type something online all you need to do is put up a petition all you need to do is is start a protest all you need to do is message someone dm someone email someone write to someone and you can achieve a huge amount and by a huge amount i mean you can genuinely change the world and i think we don't give ourselves enough credit and and realize that enough i've probably rambled through most of that so apologies but um but yeah that's basically what i wanted to say quickly Ben, that was perfect thank you so much and from the looks of the chat as well i think everyone's found that really impactful and inspirational so thank you um so much for that now i've got myself so many questions to ask to ask everyone here tonight but i know that there's been so many questions already flooding through um and we yeah no it's one of those things the q a is now open so please do stop asking questions uh, using the Q&A function. We're going to go dive straight into it because we have some amazing questions lined up. Uh, the first one is from Catalina. So Catalina, are you there? We'll give it two seconds. Hi, yes, I'm here. Fantastic, Catalina, what's your question? Hi, um, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to ask the question in the first place. I feel very inspired uh, listening to your experiences and stories. Um, my question is to every speaker today, uh, how do you deal with failure? Not only emotionally, but how can we pick up uh, the pieces of our projects and initiatives and try again? Katina, thank you so much for that question. It's something which I don't think is talked about enough and it's something which you know every single one of us faces and what i'd really be interested to hear is, is, is the panelists uh views on this so i'd like to go to noga first noga um how do we deal with failure i think for me um and i'm sure ben will probably have something to say on this as well but for me failure is is quite intrinsically linked to mental health and i know that when i failed in campaigns or when i feel that um, not enough of a difference is being made or I'm afraid that an, a demonstration isn't going to be as large or as successful. It can have quite an emotional toll and it can be mentally very difficult to navigate through that space. For me, what um, keeps me going is the reminder that, of course, time, particularly around climate change, of course, time is not on our side, but it is never too late. There is no like any time limit that is imposed you have imposed that on yourself and ultimately it's arbitrary and anything that any campaign that has failed you can you can pick up the pieces and you can try again because it it's it sounds weird but for me what works is going okay well it, it can only get worse from here so i have to keep going i have to get i have to continue to campaign i have to continue to engage in activist spaces and political spaces because if i don't do anything we could hit the worst case scenario. And I obviously don't want it to get to that space. Um, and, and so for me, it's very much about saying, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I failed. I have to pick up a piece and I have to go again and again and again, because there, there, really, isn't, there really isn't a point at which it's no longer the time to, to keep fighting for justice. There isn't a point where it's like, oh, it's fine. I'll just give up now. That there, as long as there is still injustice, you have to keep, you have to keep doing it. If you failed, that's all right. People have been failing for hundreds and hundreds of years. That you know, that's why we're only here now. People fail, and then new people come in and work together, and then eventually succeed. And this success might not be in your lifetime or even in the next five years, but you will have laid the groundwork for someday justice to be achieved. Fantastic. Thank you, Noga. And yeah, I'd like to go to Ben on this point as well. Ben, how would you sort of deal with failure? Yeah, I mean, huge one. So obviously, Noga, you touched upon uh, it um, affecting your mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hear you there. It really does. And I think this whole campaigning thing does take a huge toll on people. Um, you're constantly faced with this feeling like there's people depending on you. And that can be quite a big thing to have to deal with. But really, if I look from my experience, uh, on in terms of dealing with failure I feel like I always look at it as in I think you said it there's a 
there's a worst case scenario and, and you can't get worse, right? You can only keep going and, and trying to do something about it. And I've, I've kind of got to a point where I feel like there's people depending on the success of what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's more than, than just a little project on the side. It's, there's people depending on it. And no matter how big that project is, like whether it's campaigning for a change within your school, your town, your city, your whole country, the world, um, there's people depending on that in some form. And I think that's a really good way of going, I can't just hang up the towel, right? Everyone has bad days. You can't just hang up the towel because something's gone wrong. You could be the only person out there that's going to do that change, that's going to take that stance. And if you just quit, then that's not going to happen. Um, and in my case, and I'm sure a lot of your cases, if, if I hang up the towel and I just go, you know what, government, have it your way. We're not going to do it anymore. Then people die. They do, right? And young people die um, from what I'm doing. So we've got that responsibility to not quit, to keep going, to keep fighting. And if we make a mistake, no one's going to hold you to that. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hang up your towel, guys. Keep going, keep fighting. Cheers, Ben. And I think we had a few sort of questions about sort of setbacks and failures on the, on the Q&A. So I really do hope that that provided some light there. Um, it's something we all go through. Um, it's one of those things to embrace. If you, my, my granddad always used to say, if you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself to the limits. And if you're not pushing yourself to the limits, there's no chance you'll achieve your dream. So I think that's quite a nice little soundbite there. Um, so we're going to go now to another question, which is uh, directed to Gabby. And it's Gabby, do you think that COVID has highlighted the systemic racial injustice that exists? Gabby, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it has from the healthcare perspective. I think it's starting to shed light on who are the people that are being most affected by this? What areas do they live in? And I think that also has to do with environmental factors and the effects that has on people's health. And then who are the people that are dying from this? What population is doing that and why? And so I think as people start to look at the data, they're like, Hmm, there, there's, I think the wheels are starting to turn as to how healthcare impacts um, systemic racism and how it's kind of rampant in that. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say it's starting to highlight it. And I think it has also opened the door to then look at mother mortality rates and how, at least in America, Black women are five times more likely to die from childbirth than white women and looking at why is that? And so I think, if anything, people are starting to question what is happening and what the root of that is. But I think COVID is a great, a great case to look at that through. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabby. I think it's been prevalent both in the United States and the UK and, and across, across the globe. Um, we're now going to go to a question which was specific, uh, specifically directed to Mete, which says, Mete, did you go to university? If you did, how did you juggle your education and being a counsellor altogether? And what did you study? And I think it would be quite nice to discuss a bit more in depth about balancing full-time education, which many of us are still in as well um, as youngsters, alongside uh, voluntary work and campaigning. So Mete, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, this is it. I mean, even I don't know how I, how I done it as well. Um, but yeah, I did go to university. I also done uh, my master's as well. Um, I actually remember a point in my life in 2015 when I was working when I was going to do my master's I was an elected counsellor I was at the time you know my life my say became a full-time job after 2016 but I was doing my life my say I was working part-time at a bank I was working for the mayor of London for City Khan as his head of youth engagement and I was also a football scout and I, I have no idea how I managed to do uh, all of those things um, but I also looking back I think it wasn't a great idea to do that just because I think you know, what ends up happening is you don't end up giving 100% to anything. So you end up sort of like, even though you, you, you think you may be doing well, um, I think always to kind of focusing it down to like two or three things that you really want to do um, is massively sort of uh, beneficial. Um, and in terms of um, in relation to sort of uh, uh, the, the, how you juggle being a counsellor, I think, you know, like the reality is, is people would say to you being a counsellor is a two day or three day um, job a week but it's, it's not it's, it's you know it can be six seven days a week um, so um, if you really want to sort of go into it it's really really important that you know you really understand that you're passionate about your community like I said otherwise it can sort of uh, it will be a very very long uh, time for you and the last thing you want to do is, is sort of to go into politics to stand 
in a position and then you change your mind and then you end up resigning and then you sort of end up closing that door for you in the long term because uh, no political party would trust to put you up as a candidate again if you're going to cause a by-election, especially for a reason where you feel like you haven't, can't give any time to it. So um, I think it's really important that you really make sure that you're, you understand the purpose of why you're standing for public office. Fantastic. Thank you, Mete. I hope that answered your question. Um, so now we're going to go to a question submitted by Amy. And just a reminder, guys, if you want to ask your question live, please do put your question there and then put an L next to it. And that way we then know that uh, we can come to you. So Amy, um, over to you. Um, this is a question for Noga, but I was wondering what are your opinions on Extinction Rebellion? Noga, over to you. Yeah, sweet. Um, I, the climate movement is very complicated. It's been around for a, around over 40 years. Um, and those of us in the global north are privileged to stand on the giant shoulders of indigenous activists and environmental defenders across the global south. There are numerous organizations um, around the West and the North that have made huge impacts on climate change. And I think Extinction Rebellion is definitely one of those organizations in that everyone knows its name. Um, everyone can instinctively link to what they've done and is aware of kind of the impact that they've made. As with any organization, there are issues and problems. Um, some of the main criticisms of XR are that it uh, is predominantly white and middle class. Um, I've had quite mixed experiences regarding this. There have been some spaces around the UK where I would totally agree with that view. There have been some spaces around the UK where I would uh, disagree with it. But it's also worth considering that many of these larger organisations that are com almost completely decentralised um, like do have people that aren't white and middle class and purely characterizing an organization as um as you know this is like a problematic organization means that those who are marginalized and who are in that organization or campaigning as a part of extinction rebellion often feel left out of the conversation obviously that's one specific example um and i'm kind of right now i'm kind of regurgitating what um was said by a fellow panelist on who uh, is an XR member on a panel I was on earlier today, um, whose work I highly recommend checking out. Ultimately, I think that Extinction Rebellion, like any other climate organization, has the potential to make a massive, massive amount of pressure, but it has to do so in a way that addresses its own issues within its power structures, um, within racism that has been recorded within the organization, and um, with the class discrepancies that are quite obvious. Um, I don't think we should just cast them aside, um, but I think we should push for them to be better internally and by doing so their actions will be more successful. Brill, thank you so much Noga. I hope that answers your question, uh, Amy. Uh, the next one, we've got so many, so we're going to fire through these. Uh, so the next one is from Isaac, who said, how would you deal with the problem of the lack of connections for some people, especially within small and perhaps more rural communities who want to join more young political organisation and activities? And I think this is a really good question, because often I know when I started out, it can seem really daunting when you see people with, especially some high-flying young people with uh, masses of connections. Um, I grew up with, with not knowing anyone in the sort of political arena. So I really want to go to Mete for this. What sort of advice would you have for any young people who aren't coming into activism with any sort of connections? You know what, I think politics is um, massively sort of changing in a, in, a, in, a way, like in a weird way. I think the conventional way into sort of getting into politics where you have to know people or you have to study a certain degree or go to a certain university where it would benefit you to get into politics um, I think it's very cha it's, it's changing and I think the public mood to what they seek to, to sort of, I guess, like, like even like from an organisational perspective or from the youth sector perspective, you know, when you look at the type of advocates that they're looking to sort of now recruit, you know, they're looking for more genuine, authentic people who can relate to the community as much more. So I think, you know, whilst you may sit there and think, OK, I may not have that experience um, 
or you know i know i know the people think about you know what you have to offer those organizations and how you can help bring um a different uh, sort of angle from it i think a lot of it as well is if i'm quite honest with you dan is a lot of it will be um you know the reality is we're always going to face challenges as a young person sort of entering that arena, uh, whether it's in terms of being, you know, getting into sort of like a more an organization or whether it's the sort of the political route. Um, and I think, you know, what, what's really important is, is sort of the persistence um, and the resilience um, and not sort of, you know, taking, you know, like both the panelists very well eloquently sort of put forward about spoke about failure and sort of just because you've been told no once, um, that doesn't mean you sort of just shut shop and sort of like, go back home, you know, you need to dust yourself um, your shoulders and, you know, come back and, you know, think about how you can come, come stronger next time. And I think that's what's really important is that persistence. Um, and you see that with some of the most successful people um, in the world where, you know, it's the persistence that really have taken them through to where they are now. That's great. Thank you, Mete. And um, so our next question is going to be from Rohit. Uh, Rohit, are you there? Hello, hello. Hi, yeah, we can hear you well. Yeah, uh, wait, I'll try and get my question up. This one is for uh, Ben. I'm speaking to someone who's uh, on the spectrum and I've been predominantly in a school environment in which people aren't really aware of mental health uh, to the point we hear things from peers like it's not a big issue or the way to get over it is to just put up with it and sort of man up. I just wanted to know, do you have any advice as to how a young person like myself can make a change and spread awareness about mental health on a school level? And it, this is unrelated, but I think the work you do is absolutely brilliant and I can't thank you enough for all you're doing to make the world a better place. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, what you bring up is a very, very important point. Um, and I think I was reading through the Q&A and I think a couple of people have asked about schools and how easy it is to, uh, to sort of improve um, the conversation within schools. Um, it's, it's very difficult because young people see anything, well, young people in schools kind of see anything unique about people as being something to, to use to, to pick on them in some cases, right? But sharing your story is so, so amazing. And I can tell you when I go into a school and I start talking about my story, after I've told or talked about mental health in, in the way that I do, so many people come out. Um, and say thank you so much for that I, I think it resonated with a lot of people um, and I think there's something really powerful in, in stepping forward and sharing sharing your story if that's not something that, that you you feel comfortable doing which I know is a huge thing to, to suddenly tell everyone and, and campaign publicly within your school about um, it would be definitely worth talking to your staff uh, to your head teacher to, to teachers about getting um, sort of mental health first aid training into your school, getting students to undergo mental health training, um, getting mental health first aiders in, having speakers in, um, and you can kind of organise that from a back, back seat. Um, so it depends how you want to go, but any sort of, I think the big thing that we're lacking in schools is education around mental health. So anything you can do to improve education in your school around mental health, um, I think is really, really important. So I hope that answers your question, but pop me a message afterwards if you want to chat about any ways in. I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much, Ben and Rohit. I hope that was helpful. And um, of course, get in touch with us and we can, we can give you the panellist contacts as well. That's always more than welcome. And we are going to finish off with a question, which is actually one of the first to be submitted by uh, Sophie. Uh, so Sophie, are you there? Hello. Hi, yes. Sophie, we can hear you. Go on. Okay, perfect. Um, this is for everyone. So I was just wondering, when there's so many issues in the world, locally, nationally, internationally, all of that, and you want to um, really dive into all of it because you suddenly can see all the problems that are out there, how do you um, try and, not fix, but how do you try and um, help as many causes and do what you can without spreading yourself too thin so that you're not making the impact that you want to make? How do you try and focus what you want to do but not just uh, limit your options at the same time? Sophie, that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go to Noga for this one just to finish us off on a high because she does so much from uh, climate change to racial justice to politics. Noga, how would you answer to that? Thanks, Dan. Um, 
the first thing I would say is before like choosing a route, um, recognize how many of these different causes are deeply interlinked. For me, climate change isn't just about like the weather, it's about recognizing that this is an issue that has sprung up from colonial roots, from a system of extractivism, from kind of neoliberal industrialization across the world. And this is an issue that will affect every single intersection of social justice. And Gabrielle touched this earlier in that climate justice is racial justice and that we have to recognize that with climate justice comes migrant justice and with climate justice comes kind of the, the feminist justice that we've been looking for. And so for me, it was, it was a, a choice that I made because it was what was happening at the time um, it was because it was something that I knew I was passionate about and the more I understood about it, the more I saw that in fighting climate change, I was also fighting all these other issues. I was able to connect with people who were fighting on specific aspects around this, this one great issue of injustice. Um, so for me, I would say pick something that you know something about, pick something that you are most connected to personally and emotionally. If you if you try and go into activism or campaigning for something that you might know a lot about but that emotionally it doesn't touch you as much and this is i think where mental health comes in in that fighting for these kinds of things is emotionally taxing because you have to care so much about it you have to think this is you have to be willing to structure your life around it because it is to you the most important thing um and it's okay if you just choose one aspect. You'll see very quickly that you'll be linking up with all these other people. I, you know, I've heard of most of the people on this panel. I met Dan around a year ago at an, you know, our work doesn't really intersect that much at the time, but obviously we have stayed in contact and have slowly built up these different connections. It's okay to just pick one aspect of the thing and devote your time to it. You don't have to stretch yourself thin fighting every single aspect of every single cause. You're not going to be able to do it. And that's okay. That's what everyone else is for. Brilliant. That's an amazing uh, way to end the event, Noga. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Sophie. I hope that answered your question. And once again, um, I know we have so many questions that have been submitted. So what I'm going to do is collate all of these uh, questions that have been submitted. Some of them are absolutely brilliant questions. I'm going to send them to specific panelists who I think would be brilliant at answering them and fingers crossed we can get them up on Twitter, up on the website for anyone who's asked them. I hope that the panelists are okay with that and uh, the rest of the attendees. I'm really sorry if you didn't get your answer question, uh, your question answered today but we did try and get through as many as possible. So thank you so much to everyone for attending today. Thank you to our amazing panel. Um, this was one of the first times uh, we've done an inaugural uh, online webinar so I think it's gone uh, brilliantly it's going to be the first in the long series fingers crossed so please do keep an eye out uh, thank you so much to Ben for sharing his amazing story Gabby from zooming in from the United States it was absolutely lovely to see you uh, Mete is always a pleasure and Noga thank you so much um, so on a final note, I'd just like to say Youth Policy is going to be really active over the next few months. Please do stick with us. Keep checking our website, keep checking our socials, keep engaged. Um, I really hope today's been an inspirational event for you, that you're feeling motivated. Please do know you always have the ability to make a change. Find what you're passionate about, find your cause and just go for it. Uh, so thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you soon.